Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending this podcast, BCM with Friends, the best of the best. I'm absolutely delighted to bring to you today Guy Richardson. Guy is responsible for the development and implementation of Icon Water's business country plans, including alignment of the BC function with Icon's emergency management arrangements. So just to let everyone know, this video was recorded a while ago as part of Guy's presentation to the core knowledge sessions in Water and Power. And I decided to release it as a podcast because I found it absolutely brilliant in terms of the content and the learnings. Guy has introduced himself, so I don't need to say much about him. All I'll say is that I think you're absolutely going to love this podcast. It will give you a great understanding of the business company challenges on Australia in general, in the water industry in particular. And I'm sure many of those issues could have their parallels in other geographies and other industries. So thanks so much, Guy. Without further ado, I hand it over to you. Hello, everyone. My name is Guy Richardson, and it's a great pleasure to speak to you today about business conduit issues in the Australian water sector. But before we proceed, I'll give you a bit of background about myself. So I currently work for a water utility called Icon Water. Icon Water is the water utility for uh, the Australian national capital, Canberra. And we'll talk a bit more about that in the near future. Is as the Icon Water's business continuity coordinator, I'm the author of the, bus the business's business continuity plan and all the supporting recovery sub plans. I'm also an executive of the Australian Water Sector's Trusted Information Sharing Network Group. The Trusted Information Sharing Network Group, or the TISM, is a partnership between government and industry that aims to enhance resilience and national security issues across a, ra a range of critical infrastructure sectors, and the water sector being one of those. I also was a planner for the uh, National Water Sector Cybersecurity Exercise known as AquaX. This brought together government and industry to plan and prepare for the response to a cybersecurity disruption affecting the water sector. Before joining the water sector, I had 25 years experience working for, this, for the Australian government. I was lucky enough to be posted to the Australian Embassy in Jakarta, where I worked on regional aviation and uh, maritime security engagement with regional countries including Indonesia, East Timor, Brunei and Singapore. That engagement role brought together industry and government to enhance transport security outcomes in the region. My immediate position prior to that was the manager of the Australian Transport Security Coordination Centre, again focused on aviation and maritime security and ensuring that a, the transport, another critical infrastructure sector for, the, for Australia, continue to operate in the face of a range of risks and hazards. And prior to that, I had a long background in defence, national security and international relations. I've got a range of uh, education and training relevant to uh, critical infrastructure and business continuity, and I'm a member of the CBI. Before we proceed on, and I'll give a bit more detail about what the presentation is, I just wanted to comment that business continuity is fundamentally about resilience and for a critical infrastructure sector it's fundamentally about continuing to supply our services to the community. For that reason when I uh, talk about business continuity we'll be talking in detail about how we keep those services going in the space of a range of uh, potential threats and hazards. Thank you. So the topic of my uh, presentation tonight is from fires to floods business continuity and resilience in the Australian water sector. And I'm going to focus specifically on an early period in, Jan in 20, from January 2020 to April 2020, where the world turned upside down, where Icon Water went from handling droughts to floods. And that's really a good example of business continuity. But those were not the only issues we, had, we dealt with that day. We had a range of supply chain shortages, we had cybersecurity events, discoloured water, and of course, the pandemic. But first, let's start with some orientation. So Icon Water is a water utility in Australia. Australia is located in South, is a continent located to the south of Southeast Asia. And within that Australia, we have a federal system with a national government and seven state and territory governments. And it's the state and territory governments that are responsible for the water sector. Icon Water is located in our smallest territory. That's the Australian Capital Territory, which also has the national capital of Canberra, or the city of Canberra and we're located in the small area inside the circle. So this is the Australian Capital Territory, the area here in yellow. 
The city of Canberra, the urban area, is, he is located here in the, no in the northeast of the Territory. To the west is a large wilderness area comprised of mountains and rivers. That's where the Cotter River catchment flows and it's from this area we draw most of our, river, our water. Over here to the east is a second catchment that we, that we draw on, but that primarily goes through agricultural land and that's all captured in the Gugong Reservoir here. There is a second population called Queenbian, located again to the east of Canberra and that's about 40,000 people and the city of Canberra has about 400,000. So overall we're feeding a servicing population of about 450,000 people. So Icon Water's assets are located throughout the Territory. As we said, to the west we have the Cotter River catchment. That has three dams. Corran Dam, Bendora Dam and Cotter Dam. We draw most of our water from Corran and Bendora Dams as these are located high in the mountains and they flow up the a pipeline here to our primary water treatment plant, Mount Stromlo. Mount Stromlo sits above most uh, all of the AVCT's urban areas and that means we can use gravity feed to feed from our water treatment plant to each of our 50 service reservoirs. Over on the eastern side, Gugong Dam, as I said, located on the Queenbin River catchment, which is a primarily an agricultural catchment, so the water quality is a bit lower, feeds the Gugong Water Treatment Plant, and that requires us to pump water back up into the network, but again, we can service the entire ACT through those uh, 50 reservoirs. We also operate our sewage treatment system, so sewage is collected from the in the urban area, predominantly through gravity feed, and feeds to the Lower Malongolo Water Quality Control Centre, our primary sewage treatment plant. Then that plant treats the, uh, ep the sewage and effluent. We remove the, uh, contam the contaminants and, bio and biohazards, and we return the water back into the river system. We return about 60% of the ACT's water back, to, back, into the, back into the environment. So in a rel in a, for a relatively small population of 450,000 customers, we've got a lot of assets. Some of those assets have been there a long time. Canberra was established approximately about 100 years ago, a relatively new city by, city by world standards, but that means we have assets that are up to 100 years old that we own and manage right now. As we, do, as we manage these assets, the business continuity coordinator's role is to make sure that we're really focused on what we have to do, which is continue to apply water and wastewater services to the ACT community. So, having spoken about the ACE, about Icon Water, where we're located in the ACT and our operational setup, let's talk a little bit more about in specifics about business continuity and drawing on the, the BCI's business continuity model. So a couple of things about uh, business continuity and specifically the Australian water sector. So the water sector is a natural monopoly. That means water utilities don't have a lot of competitors. Uh, in Australia, we don't have pipelines for water, so we're not able to uh, be on local areas, obviously. So we're not. So water utilities tend not to compete with each other. We're all government owned, be that by local or state governments. Water utilities in Australia are highly regulated. I can't stress that enough because that's a really important issue for business continuity. We're regulated in, our, in the prices we can charge the health standards we have to treat the, our water to, the, the, our management of the environment. We have standards for service delivery, specified times that outages must be resolved by. And we're strongly regulated in emergency management, and I haven't put it on the slide, but increasingly in resilience as well. Or that regulation really provides a lot of the structure that business continuity professionals will look at. We're non-competitive and that's really good. That means that water utilities can share information with each other without getting uh, caught up in competition issues. Water utilities are highly engineering focused in some, the same way as power uh, and, the, and the fuel and, liquid, and liquid, the liquid fuel sector. But we've got a lot of engineers. The engineers drive how our business is designed, how it operates. And importantly, from a business continuity perspective, We've got long-term experienced workforces. In Icon Water, the average length of service is over 10 years. 
And that means we're not having to uh, tell our staff a lot of what to do because they already know their work really, really well. So what do I draw from that from some business continuity lessons? First up, PP1, professional, professional practice one, policy and program management. In the water sector, that's actually quite easy to do because you're aligned to those regulations. The business already knows that it's going to have to take emergency management and resilience really seriously because that's going to be because that ensures that you're actually meeting your regulations for the uh, health, the health and um, safety of our of our water and wastewater services and our service delivery arrangements. When we look at professional practice two embedding. The organisation has already has a high resilience focus. Because our high focus on restoring services, for example, in the ACT, we have to address a sewerage spill within three hours. We have to provide an alternative source of water for a water supply disruption within 12 hours, which means you're not having to have that argument about why business continuity is important. It's naturally clear to all of the people who work in our area, in our sector. I pulled together professional practices three and four, analysis and design. And this is where that engineering part comes in. When I started out with Icon Water as a business continuity professional, I started doing the practices of um, analysis and design. I started particularly looking to prepare business impact analysis, understand failure modes, understanding single points of failure, etc. And I started to do the work that a business continuity professional would do to, to gather that information. And I'd set up a series of meetings and interviews with colleagues in the business. And I think I was into about interview number three or four when one of the senior engineers stopped me and looked, looked at me and said, you know, all this information's in our asset management plans. And I must admit to my uh, chagrin, oh, I didn't know that. When I went and had a look at the asset management plans, a lot of the information that a business continuity, profession, business continuity professional is looking for was already there. I had maximum acceptable outages. I had recovery time objectives. I had the service standards. So it was all there in our asset management plans and also in our regulations. When we go to implementation, this is something we found really important. Again, emergency management in the water sector in Australia is highly regulated from emergency management response which means most organisations have mature emergency management arrangements, particularly for key issues such as dam failures or sewerage spills, which means it was really important as a business continuity professional to align our business continuity response doctrine, the recover or recovery, with emergency management response, response doctrine. In Australia, we use a system called the Australian Inter-Service Incident Management System or AIMS, it's used pretty widely across our emergency services, fire, bushfire, um, fire bush, bush firefighters, police and ambulance services. It's also been rolled out to councils, to state and ter territory governments, and particularly to the water utilities. So aligning that was really important. And that gave, made implementation relatively easy. But where, I, where we do have a problem, because it's not all, not all uh, easy to deal with, is that because our business is so focused on restoring services to the community, it's very, very hard to transition from a business as usual response, teams going out to fix uh, water main bursts, teams going out to deal with uh, sewage chokes and plant operators getting their plant up and running again, to that elevated response, whole of organization, emergency management, business continuity. The triggers for that, the process for doing that is always in flux and that's probably the area that as a business continuity professional I find most challenging to deal with. Finally, validation. Water utilities in general in Australia and Icon Water specifically have demonstrated a willingness to train, conduct, to do training and exercises. And we're really focused on lessons management. Again, that comes with an engineering back, background, understanding why something has failed and how can you best fit, how can you best move forward to try and fix it and make it effective.
So we're about half the halfway point of the presentation and now it's good to turn on to the uh, real world examples. And I'm going to take us back to January 2020 and what was the world that Icon Water was operating at that time. We'd just been through a three year drought. Our dams are at 47% capacity. So here's a photo of our primary, primary uh, water dam. This is uh, Corrin Dam. It's up in the high mountains of the ACT. That dam was even lower. So 47% capacity was across our network. This dam was down below 20%. And that's the dam we like to draw most of our water out of because it flows downhill gravity using gravity, which means we don't have to pay for it. That's the intake tower. That intake tower is 20 meters high. So you can see just how much water was missing out of our, net, out of our dams because of that prolonged drought. Also in January 2020, Eastern Australia was facing a major bushfire threat. And in the ACT, we had declared state of emergency. We had bushfires surrounding us and started to encroach onto the ACT. How close did they get? This is the southern urban area of, of Canberra. That's the night of one of the bushfires. This is in late January 2020. And you can see the fire front coming through the mountains, where that dam is located, by the way, burning down towards the uh, southern, air, southern urban area of the ACT. It got really, really close, and those fires are very, very intense. For those who've never seen an Australian bushfire, our native tree, the eucalypt or the gum tree, has a high oil content. When those trees catch fire, they will literally explode if they get hot enough. So we have highly intense fires. They're almost, un we can't, almost can't fight them. All we can do is protect assets, people, people and buildings from their approach, and that's how we usually do it. So you can see how wide that fire front is. And that was just one of a series of bushfires burning at that time. Basically, the, all of the southern areas of the ACT were surrounded by fire, particularly the western side in that um, pristine wilderness area we spoke about. So what was the business continuity focus at that time? Obviously, with bushfires burning, it's the protection of our staff and our assets. We're also focused on protecting protection of the at-risk community. You can see from the photo there that the fire is approaching the, uh, the, uh, the urban fringe, but we've got a number of smaller uh, villages and communities scattered around the ACT. One of those uh, villages called Uriara has its entire firefighting supply provided by one water tank that we feed out of one feed from the Stromlo water treatment plant. They, in preparation for that fire as it approach, as it approached their community, they were emptying that tank three times a day and we were having real problems keeping water up to it. We obviously had to support the firefighting operations. The urban firefighters are obviously going to use the water in our network to fight the fires and the rural fire service who fight the fire out in the bushland areas are using our dams to as places to draw water on both the tankers and for our aerial water attacks aircraft so helicopters and bomber aircraft and bo water bomber aircraft so we've got to make that keep that water going and while that's all going on whilst we have a major drought that's reduced our overall water dam capacity to 47 percent and even lower for those dams up in the mountains we've got to sustain the water supply to the community so how do we do that? We're engaged in major planning operations. This is a photo from the incident management team that's planning the response. And that's the intelligence section within that incident management team. And if you can see from the maps on the tables, you can see the bushfire approachment zones. So really focused on keeping all of that going. Real business continuity of focus, because at the end of the day, our assets were not being directly threatened, at least at that time, if they would come at a threat later on, what we were really focused on was making sure our water services continue to be provided to the community as we went along. So as I said, the world turned upside down. In January 2020, we've got fires, we've got droughts. We're really focused on ensuring that the, our, water our water services continue to provide to the community. But we had a pretty big change by April 2020. We had a major rain event just after the bushfires had gone through, unfortunately. But we had it. But we filled those dams in the space of a couple of days. They were back up to 100%. That's Corrin Dam again. That's the same intake tower that you saw before. 
and that's the water that's the water level now at a hundred at a hundred percent you can see how much the water level has raised because we had a major rainfall event absolutely drenched the catchments problem though a catchment that's been burnt by bushfires is now full of dirt and silt and sediment and that's really bad for the drinking water supply so we've got we've got a lot of rain our dams are filled up that's fantastic but the rain kept coming so we've got, our dams are starting to spill we've got a major flooding event that's Gugong Dam the dam I spoke about on the eastern side of the ACT in the uh, agricultural catchment and that's the dam overflow you can see the water pouring out of the dam into the river unfortunately downstream from that river is the city of Queanbeyan and the city of Canberra so we've got a major flood risk those dams are water catchment dams they're not flood control dams so we don't have any way of empty of emptying the dam or lowering the water level they just fill up to the edge of the spillway and they go over the top so that's what we're focused on now at the same time all that rainfall that's hitting the urban environment is impacting our sewage network our sewage network operates in gravity and it's not necessarily sealed there are there are places where stormwater is plumbed into the uh, sewage system we also have uh, manhole covers and so on because we've got to go but you get into the system and, and um, maintain it and that means the system's not sealed so that means when it rains we have inundation major flows of uh, rain runoff rainwater it gets into the sewage system and makes its way to the sewage treatment plant the sewage treatment plant operates like a big funnel and like any funnel if you put too much water in the top you over you overwhelm its ability to bring out the small amount of treated water at the bottom and it will overflow we've designed the deck the plant to deal with that and it's got a catch dam which will catch treated and partially treated effluent to try and stop it being in, going into the environment but once the dam fills up it too will overflow and that's what happened so that's the top photo there is the catch dam the catch dam is normally empty that's the that's the partially treated effluent as you can see it's pretty brown going up to the overflow which is where that hole the you can see in the side of, in the dam there the second photo down the bottom is looking down from the overflow that's partially treated effluent flowing down into the river system pretty big issue both from from an environmental damage and potentially a public health issue 2020 of course is the year that that, gave, that just kept on giving and in the ACT we had pandemic lockdowns like many other country like many other cities states and countries affected the ACT as well we had to have our staff move from office based environments to working from home we had to protect our field services and plant staff and plant and plant operators from the community because the, if they caught COVID-19 or if COVID-19 spread through those workers we had two week isolation periods in, in uh, the ACT which meant those workers could not turn up to work for, for two weeks that would hugely impact on our ability to uh, supply water and treat wastewater and if that wasn't enough um, at that time the Australian Prime Minister the uh, leader the leader of the Australian government announced we we're under sophisticated cyber attack and critical infrastructure or organizations such as water utilities had to immediately respond and we had to do that with most of our staff operating work over remote working conditions so the very way that we were keeping our operations going was was at threat so what were our business continuity priorities protection of the at-risk community both from the effects of sewage from the effects of flooding and our own workers from the effects of the pandemic protection of our staff and assets to make sure we, get, we can keep going we've got physical threats from the uh, amount of water going into the into the uh, sewage treatment system and we've got potentially cyber threats we had to restore our sewage operations our plant was overrun and we've only got one major plant I should have made it a bit clearer earlier on although we have four sewage treatment plants two of them are very very small plants that service rural, uh, rural communities in the ACT one plant uh, basically deals with light industrial waste but that puts that in all of that it's treated uh, effluent back into the network to go down to the lower Molonglo water quality control center our primary plant and that's the one that was uh, being over 
overrun. And we had to protect the environment. We had floods. We had huge amounts of water rip, ripping up our water courses. We had the, effect, the after effects of the bushfires and, war, and um, soot, burnt trees, burnt logs, dirt being in, caught up in our catchments. And of course, we're releasing partially treated effluent to the environment. So they're pretty big business continuity operational challenges. So, January to March 2022, the world turned upside down. What did Icon Water learn as business continuity lessons? That's what I'll cover off now. And I've got three I want to talk about. All of those issues, from fires to floods, cyber, supply chain disruptions, business, all those business continuity events, we dealt with them under one single whole of business business continuity plan. Although we do have some uh, sub plans, in re we have decided quite deliberately within the business not to build a, res a response and recovery for plan for every scenario we can think of. We decided that one business continuity plan, which the whole business could understand and use, was the best way. Our BCP isn't that long either. It's about 25 pages. It has the maximum acceptable outages for the major events we focus on because it's focused on our services, the delivery of water and wastewater services to the ACT community, which means it's adaptable. Regardless of the scenario we're facing or the threat that emerges, we can, the business continuity plan can be used to respond. And that's really a powerful approach. And we found that. You recall earlier on, I talked about us being an engineering business and the business continuity plan was based on our understanding of, of our, how we operate our assets, our asset management plans. That was really important for an engineering organization. The business, if the business continuity plan was a totally different thing from our asset management plans that our, that our engineers and plant operators use on a daily basis, we wouldn't have had the same ability to be flexible and adaptable to events as they emerged. It's also important that our subject matter experts, the people who are going to help us implement the business continuity plan as a members of an incident management team, won't lose, won't lose time trying to learn something new. It's familiar, the concepts are familiar to them. So that's really powerful. You won't find that in a lot of the business continuity doctrine, but it's a lesson that we've learned. And talking to other utilities, particularly in the energy sector and the liquid fuels and natural gas sector, it seems pre pretty prevalent to them as well. They're already think their engineers are already thinking about failure modes. Their engineers are already thinking about criticalities and interdependencies. Exactly the sort of thing a business continuity professional focuses on. And finally, the response and recovery teams that we employed during all those events used their understanding of the Australian Inter-Service Incident Management System (AIMS) doctrine and training to respond to the events. They weren't making up new response and recovery arrangements. They used the same processes and procedures. It meant it was common and it was adaptable. What was the lesson we learned? Invest in training development exercises before the event occurs. The photo there is literally from last week. That's a new set of, um, a new bunch of incident coordinators being trained on how to do incident management and, and, and response and recovery. We, having trained those incident coordinators, we'll put them through regular exercises to hone and enhance their skills long before the event occurs. What we found is a single adaptable business continuity plan based on the business's understanding of how it operate, how it works and operates, combined with, tra with training and development, means you have a flexible, adaptable business that can respond and recover rapidly from just about any event. And that's really the absolute gold standard, we think, in business continuity. Thank you. That's the end of my presentation. I really appreciate the opportunity to give you an insight into how the Australian water sector manages business continuity events, and also how Icon Water responded to a really complicated year in 2020, as we went from fires, and, from fires to floods and a pandemic. Hopefully the information has been of use and I'm more than pleased to be joining the discussion session. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Guy. That was absolutely brilliant. I appreciate the time that you took.
to share with us your learnings in business continuity and i hope everyone who sees this podcast can benefit from it thank you so much take care have a good day bye bye